So um, first and foremost, um, World Women's Day today. Uh, second thing that I wanted to tell people about was not that I'm trying to buy a bike, uh, <laughs> is our uh, seminar speaker this week, tomorrow, is Dr. Brad Tebow from OHSU, who may be trying to move his research program here. Uh, he does some really fascinating work with microbes and manganese. So who knew that manganese was so important? Um, haven't talked about it yet, but it turns out it's really critical for DNA polymerase and RNA polymerase. So it's not just for these purposes uh, that we're interested in, in manganese. Uh, third thing is that our guest lecturer on Friday, um, George Kaysen from my group, um, I'm going to try and convince him to wear all this stuff and record stuff and so on and so forth. Uh, he'll be talking about small RNAs and particularly CRISPRs. Um, so the clustered, regularly interspersed, short palindromic repeats. I'm not going to expect you to remember it. Um, don't worry. So <clears throat> with that, today um, we're going to finish up with regulation, um, other than the, the CRISPR and the, the short RNA stuff. Um, if we get to, we'll talk a little bit about the long non-coding RNAs um, today as well. I want to start out with DNA methylation, basically where we got to last time. Uh, DNA methylation um, is a pretty major problem as far as DNA repair is concerned. Why is that? What's the second most common DNA damage that happens all the time? Deaminations of cytosines. If you have a 5-methyl cytosine up here, methyl group hidden under our little clicker thing, um, you deaminate this, you end up with thymidine, um, which is clearly a major issue because you don't have any kind of DNA repair machinery that's specifically going to cut out thymidine. If you did, we'd have all kinds of problems. So <clears throat> what we've, however, found is that there's actually quite a lot of 5-methylcytosine that's present in our genomes. And it turns out that most of this 5-methylcytosine ends up in these things called CPG islands. So what the heck is a CPG island? So the P here actually just stands for phosphate. So it's a CG dinucleotide. Of course, in the opposite strand, it's going to be from 5' prime to 3' prime CG on the other side here. And it turns out that these are very commonly found in the genome just right together with this CG sequence. And there are lots and lots and literally thousands of them um, all together or very high concentrations thereof. So how do you get this kind of methylation? Um, happens through a wonderful, again, term here, the maintenance methyltransferase or methylase. Um, if you have hemimethylated DNA, um, and this is true, by the way, in eukaryotic systems. You don't see it anywhere near as much in, in bacteria. But in eukaryotic systems, particularly the human genome, as soon as you have a hemimethylated sequence, so just one of the two strands is methylated, this is what happens right after replication, you have methylation that happens on the other strand as well. And so it's another way of giving a epigenetic change because it's not changing the genetic information here, but it's changing the state of your DNA. Um, methylation comes and goes. Um, it's pretty dynamic, and as we'll see in just a second here, it's really important for a lot of aspects of development. So if you have mutations or some kind of decrease in the maintenance methyltransferase, um, all kinds of diseases um, will happen um, based on that. But the main thing as far as regulation is concerned, DNA methylation usually leads to gene silencing, i.e. shutting down any kind of expression from genes that are coded in these regions, which have these <clears throat> CPG methylation islands. But it's only part of gene silencing that takes place. Um, we've already talked about modification of histones. So you have modification of histones. Usually this will be, interestingly enough, also methylation of histones in terms of getting heterochromatin. 
So you'll have modification of histones, but in many cases, actually, these DNA methylases, and these are the extra methylation above and beyond that maintenance methylase, which will associate with methylated histones. So first you methylate your histones, then you're going to methylate the DNA. So you not only have compacted DNA, it's also methylated. And so that's what really seems to be most important for getting this kind of really true genome silencing. And just here, you know, 10 to the 6, you can get a million-fold difference in expression of a particular gene if it's silenced or if it's not silenced. Um, and it's pretty amazing that, you know, million-fold difference in terms of the expression. And this is just at the RNA level. Um, and again, most of that's based on both compaction of your chromatin, again, mostly methylation of histones, and methylation of the DNA. And it turns out that this is probably why most of the transposons in our genome are not jumping around all the time. Um, as we've talked about, probably ad nauseum in this class, 40% of our genomes is made up of these transposable elements that could be jumping all over the place. Uh, probably the reason that they don't very much is because they're shut down due to this methylation, both of histones and of the DNA. Exactly how that works is a very open question, and where Trill's trying to figure out um, what's going on with that. So um, this is now as a specific kind of methylation, again, specific for gene silencing. There are, however, um, some regions of the genome where you see a lot of CGs together, and this is relatively rare in the genome. This is a, an interesting question about, so why wouldn't you have too many of these CPGs or CG sequences present in the genome? Well, the reason really has to do with what happens when you have deamination of 5-methylcytosine. You end up with thymidine. So you end up with AT base pairs instead of GC base pairs. And over long periods of time, i.e. evolutionary time, you'll have anything which gets methylated on a regular basis will get transferred to an AT unless there's some kind of selection to leave it GC. You know, evolutionarily, if it really is important that you have a GC there, it's going to stay GC. If it's not that evolutionarily important, you can switch it to an AT, it will get switched to an AT. What this means is that, again, there are relatively few of these regions. We've got lots of Gs and Cs. And it turns out, not surprisingly, that lots of these CPG islands are right in front of where you have gene control regions. Why? Because those are the regions that you can't change the sequence that much. Because that's where you have to have your general transcription factors binding, any of the cis-acting transcriptional regulators that sit down right next to the promoter. So it turns out that you find in the human genome about 20,000 of these CPG islands. How many protein coding genes do we have? About 20,000. So it's actually one way to identify these genes actually pretty well. They say, okay, I've got a CPG island. Let's look for promoters around there. And it turns out that they um, map really quite closely to these things. And it's particularly true of genes that are being transcribed at a high amount in pretty much all cell types. Um, and the classic example of that is down here at the bottom, um, ribosomal protein genes. You need to make ribosomal proteins all the time. You know, massive numbers of ribosomes. Each of those ribosomes needs a bunch of proteins. Every cell needs to translate. So not surprising that we've got these <clears throat> CPG islands um, present right here at the beginning of these you know, housekeeping genes regularly transcribe genes. He's pausing. What does that mean? You have to ask lots of questions and slow me down. <laughs> or we can have a quicker question. So why is it likely that CPG islands are located in promoters? Because they're preferentially methylated, random chance, because they're protected from methylation by DNA binding proteins, because they're protected from methylation by barrier sequence binding proteins, they're protected from methylation by insulator binding proteins. None of those answers. Sorry, we don't have an F down at the bottom here, they're clickers. 
mice in here today? Ten. Vote early, vote often. Five. Okay, before I move it over here completely, preferentially methylated, random chance, protected by DNA binding protein, or barrier sequence binding proteins and insulator binding proteins. Um, most people think C. Fortunately, I agree with you. Um, why is that? What kinds of DNA binding proteins are we talking about here? Transcriptional regulators. So that's why you're going to find them in promoters. And those, those, those transcriptional regulatory proteins, which are binding there. Um, we'll actually look at some barrier proteins and insulator binding proteins um, in just a second, because it turns out that you also have methylation in some of those places as well. So C is our answer. So <clears throat> what about methylation? Um, yeah, sure, you can methylate, you can do gene silencing, et cetera. It turns out that DNA methylation is also important for something called genomic imprinting. Genomic imprinting is really bizarre. Um, and basically what genomic imprinting is, is it is a way that the cell, the organism, if a diploid organism knows whether a particular gene came from mom or from dad. Of course, you know, the mom's genes, again, International Women's Day, so the much, much more important ones here. Um, but the reason that people found out about this is they were looking at our, you know, everyone's favorite Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, how often do you get different alleles remixing, and they found that there was some very strange inheritance going on with a lot of these different genes, a lot of these different alleles. And it was found then later that this all had to do with methylation, but not so much the CPG methylation, but very specific methylation happening at very specific sequences, not just CGs, but whole stretches of DNA sequence. So what <clears throat> is going on here is outlined basically here where we have, oops, let's see, let's see if this is actually going to work. Oh, no, we're not working here. Yeah, look at my, <clears throat> my controller. Here we are. Uh, so in this particular case, the imprinted gene is a paternal gene. So we have imprinting and the methylation here are just these little red lollipops um, on either side. Um, because each time you have gametogenesis, you have to wipe out all of this imprinting because you, know, you don't know. In this case, this is your female mouse on this side. You know, it's gotten its imprinted gene from its father, but it's going to be passing on the female genes. It's only going to be the male genes here which get imprinted. And so here, we can actually have two different alleles. So we'll start out here as the paternal, the grandparental allele here, the orange one. That one is imprinted, but we've also got a grand maternal allele. It's the yellow one. Those both then are going to get imprinted in the male. The offspring here are going to have differences in terms of which allele is actually imprinted. And so again, it just has to do with the chromosome that's being inherited from you know, either the mom or the dad. In this particular case, it's the dad. There's also other examples um, as well here. It's about 100 genes in the human genome. So it's a relatively small number that actually have this imprinting that takes place. And normally, this kind of imprinting, again, DNA methylation, is going to not allow your regulatory proteins to bind to it. It's going to shut down whatever genes are right next to it. But there are a couple of interesting examples where exactly the opposite of tr is true. And one of those is shown here. It's not important what the genes are. That's why I'm not going to mention them too much. But I had one of the answers for that clicker question about 
insulator sequences being methylated. Well, an insulator sequence can't work just by itself. What does it need? So an insulator sequence is what? It's a DNA sequence. For an insulator sequence to work, what does it need? It's a DNA binding protein that's going to interact with that insulator. So the insulator binding protein. Well, if you methylate an insulator, it's actually known in this particular case, you have blocking of the binding of this insulator binding protein. So it turns out that there's now a regulatory sequence, again, one of these enhancers, that can now act on this gene that it otherwise was not able to act on. And this is, in fact, one of the ways that we found out about insulators in the first place, was having these genes that were being differentially regulated by exactly the same protein, certain distance away on the genome, wasn't working in a non-methylated state, but was working in order to activate the gene in <clears throat> a methylated state. So it's basically, you know, when we talked about this, we talked about regulation in bacterial transcription, a repressor, you remove the repressor, it's like having activation. So here it's the same kind of thing. You have otherwise repression due to an insulator element. You remove that insulator element, now you can have activation. So it's two wrongs making a right, if you want to think about it that way. Uh, there also is a nice new example, now that we're thinking a lot about these LNC RNAs, more acronyms, long non-coding RNAs, so not a protein coding RNA, as we'll see if we get there at the end. Um, these long non-coding RNAs, again, don't actually code for proteins, but they provide sequences usually for proteins to interact with. And so in this particular case, there's a promoter for one of these long non-coding RNAs, so not protein coding RNAs. That then will bind to a number of histone modifying enzymes, and these histone modifying enzymes, not surprisingly, since the gene is silenced, what do you think they're doing? What kind of modifications do you think they'll like to be making? Methylating those histones. So these will methylate the histones, compact this DNA, so you don't have expression from a different promoter on the other strand. So the other strand now is, is a protein coding strand, as opposed to the non-coding strand, which is on the opposite strand. Uh, here would make your protein now in the presence of methylation. What's this methylation doing? It's blocking the promoter for this long non-coding RNA. So default state, non-imprinted gene, long non-coding RNA that blocks things. On the other hand, if you have imprinting, then you'll be making this gene. So this is, these are two examples of actually relatively few where imprinting will actually activate a gene as opposed to inactivating a particular gene. Um, turns out that this is absolutely critical for fetal development. If you get rid of this imprinting, then you end up with mice in particular. We don't know about humans, but certainly in mice, uh, the expression of this particular gene um, incorrectly um, completely blocks fetal development. Yeah, your question. Yeah, this whole thing is called imprinting? So the imprinting process is actually back here. So imprinting is specific methylation on a sex-dependent basis. So that's where the imprinting is coming from. So specific methylation on a sex dependent basis, that's your imprinting, which can then lead to either repression of gene expression or stimulation of gene expression. Yeah? In the following example yeah. there, uh, it's activating gene expression by inactivating the deactivating LNC. <laughs> Yeah, so again, this is sort of this you know, backwards logic. Now, you're, you're, you're exactly right there. So you're activating a gene by blocking inactivation. Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Clear as mud, as, as usual with many of these things. So these are also, um, as I mentioned before, nice examples of epigenetic inheritance. There's no change in the sequence. If it's you know, 
dad's genes or mom's genes. It's going to be the modification of that particular DNA or that chromatin structure, which can be inherited. And so it's a non-genetic inheritance mechanism. And so that's the whole epigenetic um, inheritance idea, is it can be passed along from generation to generation or from cell to cell as cells divide, but it's not a change in the DNA sequence. And so there, there's this methylation, which is one of the forms of epigenetic modification. Histone modification we've talked about quite a bit. If you have one modification that's already there, your histone read writer complexes are going to bind to that modification and then write that same modification right next to it. And so that also gives you epigenetic inheritance. Last time, probably went over it too quickly, um, X inactivation works by exactly the same way. When you replicate the 2X chromosomes, if you're lucky enough to have 2X chromosomes, then after that replication, you've got to shut down one of those. And that shutdown state has to stay that shutdown state. And so this is another way. It's the histone modification, actually the whole chromatin modification, um, which is happening there. You can also have inheritance of a state, what the cell actually looks like, in what is also called these trans waves. Here this is cis because you have a modification to the DNA, which is then modifying what's happening next to it. These are these sort of positive feedback loops on a next door kind of thing. Last time we talked about positive feedback loops. This is also a way where basically the cell can remember what it was doing before it undergoes division. And this cell memory, again, it's an epigenetic inheritance. The cell divides. In this case, you've got your positive activator, which is activating itself. It will continue to activate itself. So all of the offspring here will have this activated state. There is no change in the DNA from the non-activated to the activated state, but this can also be maintained. And the last example, I'll get to your question in just a sec, uh, is what happens with <clears throat> prion diseases uh, that we talked about really briefly in terms of protein folding. It turns out that if you have a little bit of your unfolded protein in some of these protein folding diseases, particularly things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, et cetera, if you start to stimulate the unfolding and aggregation of some of these genes, and here this is the misfolded protein um, prion state, that's also maintained as that cell divides because this unfolded state down here at the bottom actually stimulates the normally folded proteins to unfold. Yeah, your question. Sorry. Um, so is there ever a time with the X inactivation where it doesn't just allow the cell to divide itself? Like, can you say the entire X chromosome, but it mixes and matches from both of them? Ah, so the question here is, uh, as far as X inactivation, this is just sort of going back to the last lecture, uh, do you sometimes have part of one X which is inactivated and um, part of the other X which is inactivated? Um, that doesn't seem to be the case, and again, that's because we're usually doing this in cis. And so once it's started to modify that chromosome, it's going to spread on that one chromosome. It's not going to spread through the cell to the other chromosome. Um, now, there are little exceptions to that, particularly the XIST, which is this long non-coding RNA, which is the important thing for shutting down that chromosome that's still being expressed all the time. Um, but that's the, the very small parts of the chromosome that are still being expressed. And that's in the one chromosome. It turns out it's not being expressed in the other one, because if you're being expressed in the other one, then that one would get shut down as well. And there are a number of diseases. There's also some really interesting things that go on if you end up with XXYs or XYYs. So some really curious and fun stuff going on there, but we'll not get into it here. Take human genetics. I'll talk about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> one more time from the beginning. No. <laughs> um, yeah, no, certainly. Um, so the idea here with what's happening in cis versus what's happening in trans actually gets back to this previous question a little bit about the X chromosomes. Is it's what's happening in one place on the chromosome that is what's determining what happens after it gets replicated. So that particular piece of chromosome will be methylated in this case it'll be associated with all of these modifications. And so it's that particular piece each time. 
On the other hand, down here, now you have something which is diffusing around the cell or the nucleus or wherever it happens to be. And so this can act on all chromosomes. It's not going to be a specific kind of case like we have with X inactivation, where it's just one of these chromosomes. Does that make more sense? Yes. Good. Yeah, cis versus trans is, you know, anyone in organic chemistry knows all about cis and trans, right? <laughs> Too much, probably. Um, so <clears throat> wrap up transcriptional regulation. Uh, this is nice review. Um, one of the things that I recommend to people when they're thinking about exams, which is happening far too soon, um, is these are really nice overview um, slides of going back and thinking about the stuff that we've talked about. So we talked a lot about DNA binding, helix turn helix, and various different methods for looking at DNA binding, uh, the bacterial repressors and activators, eukaryotes repressors and activators, and of course we've got this extra chromatin thing thrown in here for eukaryotes. And then last time we talked about a couple of examples of combinatorial control, multiple different proteins that are involved in transcriptional regulation. And actually this should really be transcriptional initiation regulation here. Various different circuits are positive feedback loops, to some extent some of the negative feedback loops. And then today we talked a little bit about epigenetics, again this last thing, and then specifically DNA methylation. So we have questions about transcriptional regulation. Yeah? What causes, uh, for example, once it's methylated, how do you demethylate? Ah, so the question is, once you're methylated, how do you demethylate? Um, there are methylases which will take care of you know, doing that demethylation. Turns out that, um, if you remember back to the imprinting slide, um, in embryogenesis, you end up with, and this is particularly in meiosis, almost all the methyl groups get stripped off. And then there are specific methylases which will come in and then remodify those ones that are important for imprinting, so a male-specific or a female-specific um, in that case. But that's a, a big sweep that gets rid of all those methyl groups. There are some methyl groups, oh, sorry, say DNA methylases, which will take off methyl groups on DNA. Those are a little bit rarer. You don't see those as much. But there certainly are, and particularly if you've got very specific methylations happening in one particular place, again, like for these imprinting, then you'll have, usually it's a sweep that takes them off, but sometimes if it's a regulated gene, there'll be a specific methylase that'll take things on and off. And we'll talk more about methylases next week when we talk about some of the cool techniques that people use for looking at methyl groups coming on and off. No, good, not a clicker question. Sorry. <laughs> There'll be more later, don't worry. Um, <laughs> so. Today, I just wanted to finish up with our regulation thing. And this is, <laughs> there are lots of courses actually just called bioregulation um, or gene regulation. We could do a whole term on regulation easily. And there are classes actually up the hill at OHSU in the biochemistry and molecular biology department where that's exactly what they do. They spend a whole term um, talking about these things. So we're just going to zip over a number of different uh, kinds of now post-initiation I like to call this regulation. Uh, most people just call this post-transcriptional regulation, but so there's a lot of things that are happening here co-transcriptionally that people talk about as post-transcriptional regulation. Again, standard terminology is post-transcriptional. I like to think of it as post-transcriptional initiation regulation. So once you've started here, um, and sorry about this extra piece here, it says RNA transcript aborts um, right here after you've started your transcription. We've already talked a little bit about abortive initiation. This is what the polymerase will do. It'll just kick out a couple of nucleotides until it has the isomerization moving into the elongating state, which is highly processive. Basically, do you really want to transcribe this gene? Um, you can modify capping, modify splicing. You can have RNA editing and nuclear export. All of these are post-transcriptional regulation, and we'll talk about um, a number of examples of each of these. Once you have your message transported out of the nucleus, which is also, surprise, surprise, regulated, uh, then how much of that RNA gets translated, where it gets translated, and how long it sticks around are all important things that are going to determine how much protein you get, 
And what's missing on here? Talked about, I was like, yeah, two lectures ago. Chaperones, what are chaperones important for? Helping protein folding. So there's an even extra step here, regulation of, of protein folding um, that we could add on here um, down at the bottom. So <clears throat> just wanted to, again, cover each of these things ridiculously cursorially, just a very sort of high-level look at some of these different things. The first one that I wanted to talk about is what's called riboswitches or also transcriptional attenuation. And basically what happens here is the RNA polymerase stops too soon. But it's completely regulated at the RNA level. In this case, there's no protein involved whatsoever. Which is really, I think, kind of fascinating. Uh, and the way that this works is the messenger RNA that's made by the RNA polymerase. The vast majority of these are present in bacteria. Uh, and that gives you an idea why did I make this little squiggly line down here? It's not in your figure. <coughs> because bacteria don't have C terminal domains on their RNA polymerase. So this happens again almost always in bacterial systems. So the RNA polymerase is transcribing its gene. In this case, gene is procuring biosynthesis, and it makes this structure. This structure is called the riboswitch. It's also called an aptamer. Um, aptamers are just sequences of RNA that fold up into a particular structure. This particular aptamer binds to guanine. Guanine, of course, is a purine. The presence of guanine says, hey, we don't need to be making more guanine. Let's not bother to make any more guanine. So it turns out this aptamer binds to guanine. And that binding to guanine changes the structure of this RNA to give you a transcriptional terminator our classic speed bump and oil, which then pops the RNA out of the polymerase. The polymerase terminates before it even has a chance to make all of these genes for curing biosynthesis. However, in the absence of guanine, this structure stays like this. The transcription terminator is never made. The genes are being transcribed steady. So is the RIGO switch encoded just before the start codon, or is the sequence just just a upstream of the start codon um, before the gene? So the question is, is basically, is it always, and I'm going to paraphrase the question a little bit here, because we'll get we'll talk a little more about it. In the 5' UTR, so the 5' untranslated region, so we're always making from about 5' to 3' here. Most of the times, it will be before you get to this A and G, before translation starts. And this makes perfect sense if you think about it from the bacterial point of view, because transcription and translation are always coupled. As soon as this A and G would come out of the ribosome, oh, sorry, the polymerase, the ribosome will bind onto it and start translating. So it's almost always in front of that. There are some cases, and we'll look at translational regulation in bacteria a bit later on, with the same projection downstream of the start codon. But for the most part, these riboswitches are upstream of these start codons. Again, the amazing thing here is it's just the RNA. Just the RNA, no proteins, except, of course, with the RNA polymerase, uh, where you're getting regulation. Yeah? So all these regulation proteins, they can, act, uh, they can stop the polymerase before it hits the stop codon? For the AUG? OK, so let's paraphrase your question a little bit here. It's, it's not a protein. It's just the RNA. And so the RNA is, is forming a structure, in this case, before it even gets to the place where you start translation. And that structure, depending on the presence of the ligand here, the aptamers are all going to bind ligands, that guanine, in the absence of guanine, is going to keep going and will make the AUG to get translation. In the presence of guanine, it changes the structure of this RNA in such a way to give you termination. And so, your RNA polymerase terminates before it ever gets to that start code. Yeah, in the back. Uh, does adenine also terminate in this particular? Is it since you're 
Yeah, so the question is, um, does that need to do the same thing here? Uh, curiously enough, in this particular case, it doesn't. It's just guanine, which does this regulation. This is just one case. There are all kinds of different aptamers. And again, these are RNA sequences that form structures that will bind to something. Um, and there are some adenine ribose switches as well. This particular case, it turns out it's just guanine. And it's not terribly surprising because that interaction is going to be pretty specific. Um, how what that's folded up to do. And there's actually, I think, in the text, we're going to some images of that one interacting with this rival switch. I didn't um, add it to my lectures. Okay, so that's just the <clears throat> RNA um, aspect of things. We talked about alternative splicing before. Alternative splicing, yeah, you can make, you know, these, you know, Gazillion, I'm going to make a zillion, 38,016 um, different possibilities from this one gene in Drosophila. We already talked about that before. But the presence of this alternative splicing, if you had just random mixtures of splicing that was happening all the time, it would be really a mess. And we talked about the RG versus the RS or SR proteins in terms of which exons are being used, which exons are not being used. That's because alternative splicing doesn't happen most of the time. Again, as seen down here, all the gray exons are being used all the time. But you have a number of different kinds of options here. Curiously enough, in yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, you have a relatively small amount of alternatively spliced genes. In humans, a whole bunch. And usually the way that alternative splicing works is that you will block one of the normal splice sites. Um, and so here, for instance, down at the bottom here, um, this is your normal splice site over here on the top. You block splicing from happening here. Then you'll have some splicing that happens in a different place. So usually it's this blocking of normal splice sites. And that makes sense because if you think about the way transcription is working, you're making the messenger RNA, and as that messenger RNA is being made, most of the time you have sequential splicing to take place. And so is blocking splicing is much more likely than actually stimulating splicing. There are a couple of examples where you're going to stimulate splicing, but for the most part it's blocking your normal splice site. Yeah? Would that be a uh, long non-coding RNA, or would that be a binding protein that this is blocking part of that exome? Uh, so I guess the... Again, I'm going to paraphrase your question here. I'm sorry. Uh, but what's causing this you know, differential kind of use of the exons is usually proteins, as far as we can tell, that are binding to exons, and particularly those exon junctions, so the SR proteins, the RG proteins. So RG, don't use this. SR, use this. Uh, and then interacting with U2 in terms of getting U2 AF, getting U2, particularly at that. You think about it from the intron point of view at the three prime end of the intron. So it's finding that three prime end of the intron, which is really the critical part of what's going on there. Uh, because of this kind of splicing, uh, probably everybody's heard about you know, one gene, one protein. No, it's not one gene, one protein, particularly if you've got 75% of your genes being differentially spliced. One gene, lots of different potentially polypeptides, but almost all of them are going to have the same and terminus, because that's what's coming out at the beginning of the gene, it's really going to be what's going on at the C terminus, which is different for your protein. And let's look at an example of that. This particular one is why at the post seminar receptions we had all these bizarre flies crawling around our fruit bowls, um, sex tones reduced, etc. Um, sex lethal is probably the best known of these gene regulatory proteins. In fact, the dying lab is right downstairs from where we usually had our receptions. That's what we discovered. So they were working on sex determination in fruit flies. It turns out to be very different than the way it works in mammals. But um, the way that sex determination works in fruit flies, it's a calculation of the ratio of X chromosomes to autosomes. Uh, and this is measured. We're not going to get into how this is actually being measured. But that leads into this sex lethal gene. Sex lethal has two different kinds of splicing that can take place. If you have a 
And it turns out you can have four X's and two autosomes, etc. cetera. Uh, anytime you've got a, a, a point, I say two autosomes and one X or four autosomes and two X's, uh, anytime this ratio is 0.5, you have a normal splice site, which gives you a non-functional protein. On the other hand, if you have a normal X to autosome ratio, which implies one, uh, then this splice site is blocked, and you end up with a full-length protein, which is now a active protein. This active protein is a splicing repressor. To get back to your question, how does this, this determination take place? It binds now to messenger RNA of the transformer gene, and we'll get back and talk about these things in just a second here. Um, that transformer gene is also a splicing regulator, but now it's a splicing activator. And so this will activate an earlier splice site than in the absence of active transformer gene, and that will give you a exon which you've completely lost. This again, just like we talked about, gives you different C termini of your proteins. And this particular protein, the double sex protein, has either male specific C terminus or female specific C terminus. Double sex is a transcriptional regulator, actually it's a repressor, so the double sex protein that has these male specific amino acids, give you one guess where the DNA binding domain is for this protein, down here, at this end, uh, that will repress the female differentiation genes, and this alternative C terminus will repress the male differentiation genes. This tells you immediately why it's called double sex. Because if you get rid of that gene, as all of the Drosophila geneticists do, what do you end up with? You end up with a fly that's expressing both male and female specific genes. And I'll let you think about what would happen if you're lacking this transformer gene. I'll talk more about it next time. But just think about what a mutation in the transformer gene um, we'll do. No, I'm not going to ask a simpler question. Mm -hmm. So it's all that. Could be on the test. We'll see. Uh, but the idea here is it's all about splicing regulation. It's making a splicing repressor, the sex lethal gene, which then that repression of splicing leads to the expression of an activator of splicing. And that then ends up with differential C termini, which turn out to be you know, DNA binding domains. So that changed the C termini. Another way, not surprisingly, to change C termini has to do with what's happening at the very three prime end of your gene. Where splicing takes place will change that C terminus, but also where you put your poly and tail can change where the C terminus of your protein is. How do you get poly A tail formation, among other things, it's the amount of your cleavage and stimulation factor, CSTF, and, as we all remember, right, um, termination, which has to do with when you have this cleavage of your messenger RNA, is happening co-transcriptionally. So if you have a low concentration of one of these proteins, it's important for getting tailing to take place, you may have transcribed far enough along before that's had a chance to come and bind to the messenger RNA. So in case we have low amounts of these cleavage stimulation factor, you're going to skip some of these poly A type um, tail sites. So here you end up with a long transcript, and here you end up with a short transcript. And that's because with high amounts of CSTF, you're going to cut early. Low amounts of CSTF, you'll cut late. Here, if you cut early because we've got CSTF high, it turns out that cut site is right in the middle of an intron. If it's right in the middle of an intron, you can't splice this out anymore. 
And if you don't splice it out, you end up with a short protein with a stop code right in the middle here. If, however, it takes a while before you cut and poly a tail, you can make this particular intron that gets cut out, and so now you have a alternative end piece here. This is exactly what happens in antibody production, B cells, anybody taking or took immunology? Yes, no? When you take immunology, you're all about these things. Uh, <clears throat> have secreted antibodies and cellular antibodies. Now, how do you get secreted versus cellular? The cellular one sticks in the membrane of the cell. How does it stick in the membrane of the cell? It's got a bunch of hydrophobic amino acids. Hydrophobic amino acids love to associate with cells. This is exactly what happens in this particular case. So, making of antibodies by B cells, if you have a low amount of CSTF, you're going to make antibodies here, which are bound to the membrane because they've got this extra hydrophobic piece that gets made by this messenger RNA. If, however, you've got a lot of this CSTF around, you'll cut in this intron before the processing machinery has a chance to take it out. This will end up with a short piece that no longer has a hydrophobic piece that's attached to it, and this will be secreted, go off and fight all of the nasty invaders that are coming inside your cell. So, alternative splicing, alternative tailing. Uh, there's also this really bizarre thing that happens to RNA called RNA editing. Why RNA editing takes place, we really don't know, but there's quite a lot of RNA editing that takes place. Um, probably the best known of these are what are called the agar enzymes. So, adenosine deaminase associated with RNA. What does adenosine deamination do? It changes adenosine to inosine. Should sound vaguely familiar. Where did we see that before? TRNA. In model and TRNAs, exactly. So, first position of your anticodon. But you're now changing adenine to adenosine, uh, so inosine, excuse me, in the mRNA. So, what does that mean? And it's being compared just like it does in the wobble position. So this can also change what kind of amino acid can be put into that particular part of your protein. How do these AR enzymes work? The vast majority of them bind to specific double-stranded pieces of RNA, usually that are also part of an intron. So this is also a modification that happens while transcription is taking place. The adenosine deaminase that acts on RNA will interact with the sequence and change this um, adenine here to an inosine. And it turns out that this is absolutely critical for brain development. If you didn't have this kind of modification, you didn't have inosines that happen here. Um, it's been done in mice. Um, people don't actually have these kinds of mutations because they die, they never actually make it through development. Uh, this kind of modification turns out to be absolutely critical for development. Turns out that there's also a whole set of these modification enzymes that are specific for retroviruses. Retroviruses like HIV, like 8% of our genome are these retroviruses, or the remnants of a lot of these retroviruses. One of the ways that we've evolved to deal with this is when RNA from these retroviruses comes inside a cell, these apobat proteins will modify that RNA so much that it can't be functional anymore. Of course, this is a balance. Everyone's heard about HIV mutates really fast. Well, it turns out that there's going to be a balance between the mutations that happen and that are going to be potentially useful, drug resistance, etc., but then also those that are overwhelming and have this uh, kind of issue. There are other RNA editing that takes place plants for sound zones. The main thing that happens here, these are poly U's that get added to some of these genes. It's a literally an insertion event that takes place, and there are guide RNAs that do this. Where have we seen guide RNAs before? DNA? 
You know, the final exams in two weeks, why should I remember these things? <laughs> uh, so, guide RNAs are going to be RNAs that have a specific sequence that leads to a particular modification. Proteins that are going to do the modifications. Yeah? Like uh, the snow RNAs? Exactly, way? just like the snow RNAs. So, the small nuclear RNAs, which will base pair and then lead to a specific change, usually due to a protein. Just going to do that. So, exactly what happens here is you've got an RNA bringing that particular protein. And it turns out it's probably how a lot of these, these long encoding RNAs are working too. Again, it's a RNA sequence base pairing in some cases, these long encoding RNAs. And they'll bring in a protein that will do some modifications that take place. Uh, one example of this RNA editing is in some very specific liver proteins. Uh, it's actually not deamination, because you see we're going from a C to a U residue here. Um, again, this is really part of the problem is that all of our cells have exactly the same DNA in them. They got all exactly the same DNA in them. How can you make different proteins that are doing different things? Well, one way you can do it is by doing RNA. -editing. So, liver genes have this sequence. Intestine genes have this sequence. But there's no editing that takes place in the liver. But there is editing that takes place in the intestine, and in this case, gives you a new stop codon. CAA codes, I can't remember the genetic code, I don't remember, I expect you to remember it. Um, UAA stop codon, right in the middle of the gene, your protein just ends up being shorter. And because of this difference in sequence, it's going to have a different function, so a structure function um, relationships with these things. So, RNA editing can give you premature stops. You can also get modifications with splicing, modifications, <coughs> With tailing, once you've modified your whole RNA, this is all still happening. We talked about before, this is a co-transcriptional modification which is happening. Now you need to get that messenger RNA out of the nucleus so the cytoplasm can actually get translated. So how does that work? We talked about this before. It's all of the nuclear export proteins looking, again, totally anthropomorphized at your RNA, making sure it's spliced, making sure it's capped, etc. Uh, turns out that a number of viruses, particularly retroviruses, have these RNAs. They need to get out of the nucleus in a non-spliced state. So it turns out that they have specific proteins that they make, the, pro the virus makes, which basically tricks the nuclear export machine. And these proteins, in this case it's called the red protein, uh, it then goes back into the nucleus, binds to unspliced RNA, and transports it out in the cytoplasm where it can get made into a whole new virus. This is just a really good example, but there are other examples as well where nuclear export gets regulated. Well, now we finally get our messenger RNA out of the nucleus. What do we need to do with it? Translate it. And also, where? this particular RNA gets translated is very important. You remember the Bitcoin and Hunchback and all of the other regulators, Giant, Purple, etc., in terms of even skipped? You remember this big gradient of Bitcoin and Hunchback from the anterior end going down to the posterior end? How does that work? How do you get one of these gradients? Well, one of the ways you can get this gradient is by having a messenger RNA in the embryo stuck at a particular place in the embryo. If it's getting translated in that position, then you're going to have more of that protein there, and it can diffuse the rest of the way down the embryo. It turns out that's exactly how you get the gradients of Bitcoin and Hunchback, is that the messenger RNAs are stuck at one end of the embryo. How are they put there? Mostly through sequences in the three prime untranslated region. So we've talked quite a bit about the 5' prime untranslated region, that's the ribo switches, etc. The 3' prime untranslated region also can form particular structures which can then bind to places in cells or places in the embryo in order to get localization and that's how we get <coughs> specific locations inside inside a particular cell, or again, in the case of the embryo, it's one big cell and one particular place. 
So, <clears throat> review all of these things. Have a clicker question. Turn it back on. Uh, generate a C terms for first with an alternative sequence. Start. Uh, which of the following methods of post transcriptional regulation, post transcriptional initiation regulation, we most like travel switch, alternative splicing, RNA editing by ADAR, RNA export, or messenger RNA localization? We actually had an example of this that we talked about. termination. It turns out that this can also regulate translation. How is translation mostly being regulated? It's mostly just the presence of the AUG. If you have an AUG that the small subunit of the ribosome can bind to, then you'll get translation. If you have an AUG which is in some kind of secondary structure or blocked by some kind of other protein that's associated with it, you're not going to get translation. Yeah, in the back. That AUG needs to be based here, presumably, with the complementary strain, right? So does that mean that termination sequence is actually AUG and upstream of that and another sequence? And if you have a modification to either one of those, you lose your stop sequence? Yeah, I'm a little confused by your question, but basically the idea here is that the AUG can't, well, back up a little bit. So AUG has to be available for the ribosome to associate with. And if the AUG is not available for the ribosome to associate with, you're not going to get translation. And so that could be through base pair interactions, which is what we have down here, or it could also just be a protein which is bound to the RNA and blocking access to this AUG. You can have small RNAs, so these guide RNAs, for instance, they're going to base pair, block the AUG because it's in a base pairing interaction. And this, what are called antisense RNAs, are really good ways of shutting down translation because once it's in a double strand, you can't get the initiator tRNA to associate with it. Uh, one of my favorites is this one up here that a buddy of mine, to be perfectly honest, works on. Uh, it's what I call a um, RNA thermometer. So at a low temperature, there's a secondary structure that forms. But if you heat this up, just like you do with DNA, the base pairs are going to break. And that allows the AUG to be used. So all three of these ways can regulate translation. And the main thing which is being regulated here again is just the access to that AUG. You have to get your initiator tRNA, the AUG, in order to get translation to take place. So, four different ways that, that that can happen here. Another thing that has to happen with your initiator tRNA, how do you need to, how does the initiator tRNA associate with the AUG? What do we need in order to get that association? Yeah, I have two, exactly. Ian's reading the slides. <laughs> EIF2 also has to be bound to GTP because it's that GTP hydrolysis which gives you the assembly of the full translation initiation complex. How do you get EIF2 GTP? Well, it turns out that just like for almost all of the other GTP binding proteins that we've talked about, 
you need a guanosine nucleotide exchange factor. Uh, here, AF2B. EF2B recycles this GTP bound form, GDP bound after you've done initiation, will recycle, do this again and again and again. This is great if your quantity nucleotide exchange factor can interact with EF2. One of the things that cells do if they get stressed, really nice stress, of course, being infected by a virus, is they will phosphorylate EIF2. Why is EIF2 phosphorylated? Once EIF2 is phosphorylated, it can no longer actively interact with EIF2B, so you don't get active EIF2, which shuts down translation. Now, this is a really good thing to do if you're infected by a virus, because all viruses require translation from the cell. A bunch of you signed up for virology next term. We'll talk a lot more about this um, in that case. And of course, viruses know this. Again, totally other end of And have figured out ways to get around this. Turns out that this is also used, however, in normal cell cycling. A lot of cells in our body are what's called G0, so the resting state of the cell cycle. Not translating very many genes. We talked about before, translation is incredibly dependent on lots of NTP hydrolysis. Shutting down translational initiation also is going to save you a lot of energy. And so it's also in a normal process of, of phosphorylation of EAF2 giving you this. So it's access to your, your AUG or what you need to have with your initiator tRNA to bring it in to get translation initiated. Yeah? When it's stressed, does it just slow it down or does it stop it completely? So the question is when, it's, when there's cell stress, what happens? It turns out that in cell stress, very often you will phosphorylate, um, <clears throat> excuse me, EIF2, and that will block new translational initiation, and so it really does shut down translation pretty well. Yeah, in fact. Does that phosphorylation get degraded so that it can resume cycling, or does it get, or does the whole protein uh, get degraded um, and then new transcription and leads to new transcription? Okay, yeah, so the question is basically what happens to EIF2 after it gets phosphorylated? There's also a phosphatase, um, which can come in and take that off, and you can restart that whole process. That's exactly what happens when you have a cell which is in the G0 phase of the cell cycle that then moves back into the regular cell cycle. Phosphatase comes in and takes it off. You can have the normal cycling process that takes place. Finish up with this last example of translational regulation. Maybe the last one. Uh, having to do with, again, thinking about translation. What do you need for translation? You need your initiator tRNA, you need the AUG, but also, if you think about eukaryotic translational initiation, the ribosome is scanning along that messenger RNA looking for the first AUG sequence. If you have low amounts of ribosome scanning, sometimes you'll skip some of the earlier AUGs, and this happens at low, at, sorry, excuse me, high. Yeah, yeah, 4F, yeah, 4F is 14 4 together, both of them together. On the other hand, if you have low amounts of yeah, yeah, 2, then you'll scan much more across your RNA and end up with AUGs which are a little bit further downstream. Um, it's discussed quite nicely in the text, uh, but you can also just think about the amounts of these different proteins and why it should cause earlier AUGs or later AUGs to be used. Uh, George will talk about CRISPRs, small RNAs, and maybe about some of the rest of the collector. I'm going to leave that up to him. Um, see you on Friday.